is we're going to be talking about justice, uh, criminal justice, uh, and then the two main types of justice, punitive and rehabilitative justice. I have a few, like a bit of material prepped already. It's not like refined. I'm going to sort of refine it right now with you guys. Uh, I'm probably going to get points and feedback and thoughts and arguments and resources maybe from you guys that you guys are going to pass over to me. And I'm going to take a look at that and incorporate it into the thing like a, a dialogue, I guess where we develop our positions. First of all, we got to start with definitions. Definitions are pretty important. Okay, so punitive justice, uh, retributive justice. That's one of the main patterns. Revengeful spirit, I guess, um, behind the punishment. Then things like an eye for an eye uh, is often invoked. A main argument that people talk about it often is that it's, it's a deterrent to crime because if there is super harsh punishments, then it sort of tilts the, the risk sets reward scales whenever somebody's considering committing a crime towards, you know, uh, risk being more severe than the reward. Partially built on the idea that people can't be changed. Yep, absolutely, that's a good point. And if we talk about some more like philosophical things like, like free will or determinism and stuff like that, we can sort of weave into free will uh, more into punitive than we can for rehabilitative justice, right? The reason why we think it's okay to enact punitive just judgment or sorry, punitive justice is because we believe that the person who has committed the crime is morally culpable and that they had responsibility and agency behind their actions. So therefore they should receive punishment for those actions. Rehabilitative justice, which is more focused on pragmatism. It's more forgiving in nature punishment well i guess the punishment should i if we put it for both of them because these kind of this sort of like more of a meaningless platitude but punishment should fit the crime rehabilitative justice focus less on deterrence i guess more on reducing recidivism faith in people's ability to change and more deterministic in nature punitive action is based on religion yep to some extent, absolutely. Rehabilitative justice tends to be more secular. An important thing to discuss, I think this was my first point down here, yeah, is the principle. This gets into more axiomatic beliefs. What is justice? One interpretation might be allow for the ability to retribute injustices that have been brought upon someone. People, you know, running society, doing their, their property rights things and, you know, just having a good old time, okay? The job of the state is to equalize any forms of injustices committed by one party to another party uh, through the use of punitive justice then. Then we have the other viewpoint, which is that justice systems should aim to minimize the amount of crime or behaviors that need to be addressed by the system. This one could technically go for both sides, right? You, you could have the belief that punitive justice does this better than rehabilitative justice because it has more of a deterrent effect, while people on the rehabilitative side might be like, our system is so much better at minimizing recidivism and because a lot of crimes are committed by people who commit multiple crimes, therefore we'll have like a more deterrent um, principle to it. And then there might be a third principle here. This is definitely more on the uh, rehabilitative side. The role of the criminal justice system is to amend the failures of the state, which caused an individual to engage in negative behavior. This sort of principle presupposes the idea that the reason why people commit crimes is because the system has failed them. And therefore, it should be the role of another, you know, entity of the state, the criminal justice system, to address and to adjust and amend the failures from the other parts of the state there. Well, these are a bit harder to argue. Th these have a lot to do with just axiomatic beliefs here. Although th th this one pretty much heavily favors the punitive side. This one could go for both, although there is a research backing to this, uh, which I'm going to talk about in just a bit, that heavily leans towards one of these sides. Spoilers, it's the rehab side. And then this one, which definitely heavily leans towards rehab, rehab, rehab justice. I sort of got that word. Oh, let's do some research. That is the meta analysis, so that's boost to credibility and relevance, but then it's fairly outdated. We have the National Institute of Justice. Um, even though this is not a study, this probably is a you know fairly reputable source. It's a it's a government organization of the United States. So the point number one here, 
uh, oh, and this is linked as well, illustrates that it tends to be more likely that the punishment itself isn't a great deterrent factor. It's the likelihood of being caught. Sending a person to prison doesn't seem to be an effective way to deter crime. Prisons are good for punishing criminals and keeping them off the streets. But prison sentences, particularly long sentences, are unlikely to deter future crime. Prisons actually may have the opposite effect. Inmates learn more effective crime strategies from each other, and time spent in prison may desensitize many of them to the future threat of imprisonment. Effect of prison on recidivism, stigmatization, economic effects, environmental influences. Uh, police deter crime by increasing the perception that criminals will be caught and punished. Uh, now there are quite a few issues to hotspot policing, as one might say, which can lead to over-policing in certain areas. Increasing the severity of punishment does little to deter crime. There's no proof that the death penalty deters criminals. According to the National Academy of Science, research on the deterrent effect of, criminal, uh, of capital punishment is uninformative about whether capital punishment increases, decreases, or has no effect on homicide rates. So this just seems to be an agnostic position on the effect of, uh, of death penalty on recidivism. Okay. Yeah, so th this is the same thing, right? That the, um, that the severity of the punishment doesn't seem to have a significant effect on, on whether or not somebody is likely to commit a crime. It, it, it's whether or not you're going to be caught. Uh, social nuts. There we go. Then we have this one. Uh, 1968. Are you serious? 1984. These are really old. So this still has to do, seems to have to do more with being caught rather than uh, than the actual severity of the crime. Defines the terms and irrelevance theory of the criminal justice system, which is 1993. There's so many outdated citations here. So they have an interesting point here in which they state that effectiveness of higher punishments on deterrence depend on public perception of whether or not that higher punishment matches the crime okay wow well, so it doesn't um oh my this is a long conclusion wait did i miss okay it doesn't seem to be divided into sections oh my god why do you format your thing like this i swear to god okay Okay, this is useless. <laughs> do harsher punish? Uh, do harsher prison conditions? Look, do harsher prison? Do harsher prison conditions reduce recidivism? So this basically supports the conclusion that yeah, harsher uh, conditions within prison do not do not help uh, recidivism. In fact, make it much worse. This says that the uh, the, the social effects that come with prison uh, tends to outweigh the I guess the deterrence of it. This was 2011 as well. The overall findings show that harsher criminal justice sanctions had no deterrent effect on recidivism. On the contrary, punishment produced a slight 3% increase in recidivism. These findings were consistent across subgroups of offenders. We're just speed running through a, a bunch now. Oh, the lynch shopping. Hell yeah. Sweden. Uh, 2019. Okay, this one's pretty recent. Okay, so this one seems to actually say that getting rid of a section of the law that allows for people to be punished less harsh if they're younger might be beneficial to society. Like it's very specific because they can, you know, literally count on exact, you know, numbers, uh, what the effect might be. Here's it talking about the assumption that people who engage in crimes engage in like a rational calculation uh, when it comes to them committing the crime. So this one seems to illustrate that having harsher punishment does not reduce crime and actually increases it. Uh, 2019, rehabilitation and program for adult offenders, a meta-analysis, okay, meta-analysis, 2019, good. So what, we can sort of like gather from here. It seems that having harsher prison sentences does not reduce a person's ability to end up committing a crime. So your likelihood of being caught is a more major factor than the exact punishment for the crime in question. Higher sentences have a negative effect on recidivism in general. Of course, there was the Sweden one, for example, which demonstrated one specific policy and how that might have a positive effect if you cut some leniency there. Uh, but it seems like generally the consensus tends to lean towards that having harsher punishments does not reduce recidivism. Why might that be? Let's try to understand that because at the end of the day, an important thing to always do when we when we discuss a topic is understand why something happens, not just that it happens. So you have number one, stigmatization. People that have engaged in those activities as the past are then assumed to be bad people inherently or like from their character, which is different than one of the underlying sort of assumptions that we have in the rehab perspective where we kind of look at justice as the state has failed to accommodate this person and therefore that needs to be amended. By, for example, being branded as an offender or somebody who's been in prison, it is harder for you to do anything basically. So because people in prison are held in these very, very, very different environments. 
than what a regular person is, you're very much a social outcast, right? So it's harder for you to reintegrate into society. And because it's harder for you to like reintegrate, you're more likely to engage in crime. Yeah, your social net and stuff like that are massive predictors of your crime. Uh, anyone know if Norway's criminal rehabilitation approach is unique? Norway's is very, very um, rehabilitative in nature. They don't even have life in prison and stuff like that. So Norway prison system boosts, uh, boasts a 20%, which is super low recidivism rate compared to the 76.6 recidivism rate in the US. Then for economic effects, going to prison is devastating. You have a bunch of years now on your resume where if somebody asks you what happened in between these years, you, you've, you've nothing you can say. It's also debts you have and stuff like that may pile up. You may have to make a massive slashing to your quality of life after you come out of prison because of that. It's harder to be employed. And why is this important? That's important because we know that socioeconomic status is the best predictor of crime. And because you're put in a, in a, in a place where you don't learn new skills, you don't develop, you don't further build a career, you don't do anything, you lose a lot of like sort of momentum and stuff like that. So environmental influences, wherever people are, wherever they're put, whatever communities they engage with. If you're put in prison with these kind of people, your common bond is going to be you all engage in criminal behavior and you build an identity around you. You begin to see yourself as a criminal. Guards in prison are often cruel to prisoners and treat them like animals. There is also that many prisoners need to join gangs to survive. Yup, exactly. If you're like literally like a super psychologically stressful place for so many years of your life where you can be attacked at any point in time, you need to know how to defend yourself. You need to join these gangs to stay safe. Um, you need to do all these things. It can be hard to get out of that pattern once you actually come out. And then social nets, because of the stigma around, you know, you going to prison, you're going to lose a lot of like friends out of prison, friends that you had, and you're going to build new people, build new connections within prison. But won't Nori extend the sentence of an individual if they deem them to still be a threat to society? Yes, they will do that. So it's not just like, oh, you killed all these people. Um, now you get a low sentence and there's nothing we can do about it when the sentence is like reaching a sentence. No, they will re they'll take another look at you basically within a rehab oriented imprisonment you can learn skills and acquire knowledge because of this you become more desirable on the job market don't throw away time of your life not developing form communities around skills and knowledge spheres rather than shared criminal behavior allowing for the generation of for salary in prisons this has to be implemented in a good and humanitarian and reasonable way that to minimum wage or higher so that it's not like slave labor wages basically allow for the accumulation of wealth and capital environmental influences orientation of imprisonment is not to seen as a punishment but rather an intervention designated uh, to allow for reintegration into society lower sense of being a social outcast less likely to form communities around criminality social nets use of workshops less stigma around imprisonment the employment services get a lot of shit in sweden and in a lot of other places as well for being ineffective they act as a counterweight to people who aren't able to get a good social net when it comes to like employment through other means. I feel like a lot of the issues that people have in general when it comes to government services and stuff like that aren't fault of government services themselves. It's just a lack of it being implemented in the best way possible or poor management or poor running of the entity in itself, such as the, you know, employment services. There may be some issues with it, with how it's run, but that's not an indictment of employment services as a concept or as a government institution. So many issues that we talk about um, when it comes to to politics and stuff like that, like institutions that aren't working or ways to structure business or economics and stuff like that. A staggering amount is just about competency. And a lot of it is because education systems could be so much better. If we work through a deterministic frame point, one way we can view crime, if we believe that people are products of their environment and the people they're raised around and the social communities that they are raised in and the state is the most powerful entity that exists right now then it seems reasonable to blame people acting in ways that are counterproductive 
on the state, especially given that it's also the state that sort of punishes you for the crimes. If you look at things from more rehab perspective, rehab oriented perspective, you can see that the fact that somebody committed a crime 100% can be the failure of the state to properly give them the tools that they need to succeed in life and to not engage in criminal behavior. Therefore, the purpose of the state should not be to enact revenge. The job of the state should be, okay, we need to fix what we messed up here. Paternalism and infantilization. One of the things that one might argue in favor of more punitive justice is that orienting justice in a rehabilitative way um, sort of necessarily infantilizes you. Why is this a bad thing? Well, there's an interesting thought to be had there more than like an argument, which is that a rehabilitative system of justice presupposes a moral or political paradigm somewhat stronger than what a punitive justice system does, right? Because the punitive justice system more of ways like accepts and gives you more responsibility and agency over your actions while the, uh, the rehabilitative one sort of like assumes already what the desirable outcome is. Uh, which is not engaging in whatever criminal behavior that they're talking about, regardless of the sort of morality of that criminal behavior in itself, because we know that laws and morality aren't like perfectly congruent at all. Um, so that's just like an interesting thought to, um, to be had there uh, when it comes to paternalism and infantilization. Let's try to summarize what we have so far. Punitive and rehabilitative justice. What is justice? What constitutes justice? What do we want uh, justice to mean? What do we want justice to do? Number one, it should be the ability of the state to allow someone to enact retributive action for an injustice that has been enacted upon them. The justice system should aim to minimize the amount of crime and criminal behavior that is committed within society. And then there is the role of the criminal justice system being as a way to amend failures of the state and to demonstrate failure of society has led someone to engage in criminal behavior. I'm in favor of rehabilitative justice, and I think many of you are as well. So when it comes to discussing these three things, what your goal then is going to be to do is commit to some of these positions each. You need to find a um, uh, resources that illustrates that more punitive justice is not productive when it comes to minimizing the amount of criminal behavior that occurs within society because of all these things we mentioned here. And you need to be able to explain this because just providing a resource or saying something uh, to a lot of people is going to be so counterintuitive that even though you're right, they're not going to buy it. There we go. Punitive versus rehabilitative justice.